how do we how do we ramp up? How do we get from here to there by way of seed capacity and understanding what seeds we should be growing and are we going to be doing land race or ancient or modern or pre uh, you know pre 1880 or you know what do we grow and how do we know uh, what, what should our expectation be and how do we um, convey all that information so that the farmer who has to make a decision on his own as to what seed he wants to grow. What kind of information do we give them and then what kind of information can we gather so we can give it to a bakery who's um, you know, trying to make a decent bread or a decent something else. And, um, and what are our options in milling? What's, what's possible? <coughs> and um, so it turns out a lot of stuff is possible. And um, so that's what this is about. So I'm gonna, I think we should start with Stephen. And um, uh, so just by way of introduction, Stephen, you've met. Stephen is very important to this whole process. He just understands things about farming and varieties that we really don't know and we're working on him. Um, Janice is California Wheat Commission, and so that's another important slug. So we're trying to um, build this uh, information base. Um, Joe is the, you know, very early on, Joe, I found Joe, you know, I was getting some wheat grown out and didn't know what to do with it. And, and uh, he was milling whole grain. And I have a restaurant that is white flour. You know, it makes really, you know, it's famous for uh, elegant white silky noodles. And um, so it's a problem, you know, but I had found this wheat in Italy and the Romagers who aren't here, that's unfortunately, it's their mother's birthday. Um, uh, I didn't know what to do with it. And um, so once we found Joe, who could mill whole grain, and it was really different. The flour was really different. And my stated goal was, was flavor nutrition. There's not a lot of flavor in white flour. And um, so then, OK. That, that sort of set that in motion. Doug, we found along the way, Doug is, is central to a lot of small farm wheat production. He is a wheat producer himself. He has something called the Mendocino, Mendocino Grain um, Project. Project. Um, he works with dozens, I think, of small farmers. And he, uh, he harvests for them and he mills and, uh, and tries to keep, and it's like herding cats, I think, is sort of like. <laughs> and um, so this has sort of been a really good start for us. We're meeting later on with uh, more farmers, and we're really trying to work with um, Matthew, who's at the end, who's worried about how you market this. We're all worried about how to market this. And while we're all whole grain advocates in this room, probably almost everybody, um, <laughs> the world isn't like that. And Whole Foods is a special grocery store, but it's a grocery store. And um, so Matthew's in charge of the bakery, and, and um, he is trying to figure out how do you get from here to there. And, um, and what I'm seeing is sort of remarkable change rather quickly in, in acceptance, you know, at different levels, you know, certainly at the store level. Um, and at some point, we're going to add our baker. So Sherry Yard is up from L.A. Sherry was executive pa uh, pastry chef for Wolfgang Puck, all the Wolfgang Puck recipes, restaurants, um, uh, 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 an amazing talent, and um, is now starting the old Helms Bakery. So it's a really famous old bakery in, in Los Angeles. Very important. So she's got a really exciting project. So she got the whole grain bug at some point. We're really glad. Um, Chad isn't here yet. He had to bake this morning. But we have a ton of bakers. We have Josie Baker, and we have Dave Miller, and we have Eduardo Morel. Um, there are others around also. So, it's a, so that's, that's the afternoon. Why don't we start with you? And just, you know, like, how do you approach this? Sure. Um, thanks, Bob. And I. By way of introduction, too, I should say that I grew up in Cupertino. I 
went to school at Chico and Davis, and I was glad to hear about the hangovers, um, having <laughs> come from Chico State. Um, my, my first wheat crop was 1977, and I grew it in Butte County. And I, I've grown wheat every, every year since. So I'm a wheat breeder now at Washington State University. We're housed north of Seattle in the beautiful Skagit Valley. Three people from my lab are here, and if they're all real shy, but if they raise their hands. So uh, Jonathan, the one with the beard, is the baker. Colin is a PhD student working with colored wheats. He works with purple and black and, and red wheats. Bethany Economopoli is on um, under the candle there. She's a PhD student working on um, uh, nutritional value of the bran and the germ and how to mill it to get, get these things available. Um, I'll, I'll talk pretty quickly because I, I spoke a little before lunch, but, but I want to uh, address the why local. For us, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's about community. It's, it's about not exporting our value, right? So it's creating value within a community and keeping that value in there. We're, we're not exporting wheat and importing flour. We're not exporting wheat and importing bread. We're not exporting barley and importing malt and beer. We're doing it right there, and we think it's critical. For my program, we start with the farmer. We work directly with the farmer, the miller, the baker, and the end user, the consumer, and the nutritionist. So, so for us, it's all about keeping value within a community. And those communities are, are with us in Skagit Valley. They're down here in northern and central California, southern California. We work with small millers in 12 different states, testing their, testing their flour in our bread, lab, bread laboratory to see how it does. We do 100% whole wheat. We don't compromise. We may fractionate the, the wheat, but we do things to that bran and germ, make it more available or make it taste differently, and then put it back in. We don't, we don't cheat. We do 100% whole wheat. We think it's important to push ourselves that way um, as scientists. I was just in Copenhagen three days ago, and they're doing the exact same thing we're doing here, but they're better at it. So I went to probably 12 different bakeries, and every one of them is, is using uh, local wheat. They're using varieties. They're using new heirloom, new land races that were developed. I met with a wheat breeder there and, and several uh, bakers and chefs, and we hung out. and. Uh, it's incredible what's going on there. What's going on here is going on there. It's going on all across the, the globe right now. And, and they look at it in, in Copenhagen or Denmark or Sweden or Norway or Germany or Italy the same way we do, of a place of community and, and what better way to define your community than on the grains that you're growing. We like to say this isn't heirloom iceberg lettuce that we're working with, right? It's wheat and, and no offense to lettuce growers. Um, here, but um, but it is important. Um, uh, as a as a breeder, I develop new material. I don't want to be uh, uh, looked at that I'm doing something evil. I if we look at varieties from the 1880s, when those were grown, they were brand new, right? And those breeders that developed those in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, or 1910, they would just crack up that we're still growing that material. And they'd crack up because it was the most modern thing that could be developed at that time. It's not to say there's not value there, but I think we need to keep moving forward too. And as a breeder, if I'm not doing GM, if I'm not doing funky stuff with Monsanto or whoever, we're doing it for the community, for the chefs, for the millers, for the bakers, there should be nothing wrong with us improving varieties. Again, it starts with the farmer. So, so we work with farmers that'll get 1,000 pounds per acre on some funky heirloom. That's fine. You ain't going to be able to sell that wheat to make flour, to make bread that's going to cost less than 20 bucks a loaf or 25 and I see some bakers here shaking their heads, yes. We can capture flavor and all these traits that are there in modern heirloom, modern types of varieties. Okay. We still grow the old ones, we love the old ones, we capture value from those and move on to where they may not lodge, they may have disease resistance. And just because it was old doesn't mean it's good either, right? You can, you can look at apples and tomatoes and wheat. We've baked, so we, we grew 163 of the wheats that were grown in Washington from 1840 to 1950. Wow. There were 165. We were able to get 163 of them. Some of them really sucked, <laughs> right? And, and they should have gone away. Some were, some were great, and some were as good as the, the things we're using now. So I think it's a, it's a valuable lesson, but as a breeder, 
I do get beat up by people that say we're producing hybrids, we're doing GMO, we're doing, we're making the wheat bad. We're not doing that, right? At least in our program, we're not. So I don't want to sound offensive there. Maybe Just I did. How many wheat breeders are there in the country? You told me you're the only ones who's not, who, the only lab that's not doing GMO. How many are? The, the question was how many wheat breeders are doing GM? I, I believe we're the only public wheat breeding program in the nation that's not working with a corporation that's sticking genes into wheat. And how many are there out there? Most states, most states have, we have three others. So we have four wheat breeders in Washington. So there's a couple hundred? Oh, public breeders, there's probably 40, 50 maybe. So. And it, it, it's fine, they can do what they want, but, but we're not doing that. Our, our research center is GM-free also. So um, our university is not, but our research center is because I'm the director, so it's nice, <laughs> it's nice to be the boss. Um, so um, uh, there, there were some points on, on milling, and, and David and Mark talked about studies. We're doing those studies, that's the work that Bethany's doing on uh, we have a roller mill in the lab, we have stone mills in the lab, we have uh, hammer mills in the lab, we have burr mills in the lab, we have magic mills in the lab, we have eight different mills. Bethany is designing projects to study the effect of milling, not just on the functionality or the, the rheological properties of the bread and the, and the products, but also on the nutritional value as well. So we'll be working with, with David and, and Mark and others on that. So I think that work needs to be done. There are a lot of questions that come up on that. Um, we're, we're moving beyond wheat, so um, I, I think we, we pride ourselves on trying to look, really look forward. Uh, I have a PhD student that's working on oats, 100% oats. So you look at a, a state like Iowa, uh, it, it demonstrates everything that's wrong in this country in agriculture. <laughs> so uh, Iowa used to be an incredibly diverse state. It used to be the oat center of the of the nation uh, used to grow a lot of wheat. Today there's more wheat in Florida than there is in Iowa, okay? There, it's wall-to-wall -wall corn. If, if we think that's great, that's great, right? We, we don't make judgments, we offer alternatives. Um, our valley used to have 100,000 acres of oats in it. Today there's not one oat in it. Um, there are going to be oats planted in the White House garden this spring. Okay, there are going to be more oats in the White House garden than there are in Iowa, okay? <laughs> that doesn't make sense, right? So we look at oats for, for human food. We look at them as poultry rations as well. So we don't want to export our grains and import feed for our, for our organic dairy farmers and, and poultry farmers. So we're looking at oats as a ration. Uh, what we run into with, with even our, our best uh, organic uh, meat and, and poultry and dairy producers is they got locked into a corn soy ration like, like that's the pyramids, right? So we're, this, this is a recent type of ration that they're doing. So for them to come out of that corn soy ration and import all their grain, it's difficult. But we're working with them to add oats back in and barley and crops like that. I have a student that works just on barley. He works on barley for food. So he works on naked flake barley uh, for cereals and things. He also works on barley in malting. Um, we're working with buckwheat. So buckwheat from a culinary standpoint, buckwheat from a baking standpoint. So um, we're working with Sonoko Sakai. She's in LA, she splits her time between LA and Tokyo. She's very good at soba, the soba end of it. Um, she's done workshops up at our research center. She works with a, a miller in Tokyo that would receive buckwheat from the state of Washington in big containers. He would clean it, he would mill it, and he'd send it back to us at 10 times the value. And even he said that was stupid, okay? <laughs> We're bringing him. In 10 days, he'll be at our research center. The Port of Skagit is going to work with him to put in a uh, buckwheat mill. So we're going to clean and mill our buckwheat right there. We're going to set up with bakers and culinary folks in the, in the Seattle area for that. So, so that's what we're involved in, too. And it goes back to why local and, and uh, what local is. I mentioned malt quite a bit. We, we have uh, a malting facility that started up in Skagit Valley. Uh, this started four years ago. We had a field day where we had farmers walking through the field. We had a maltster come down from British Columbia that was interested in some of the barley varieties. We had a plant breeder from Oregon State come up. The farmers looked at this barley and said, we want that. We want that barley right now. 
So, so we released that variety. They're growing it. The maltsters at the same time heard from this maltster in British Columbia that you can multiply the value of barley at least 10x just by malting it. Okay, you germinate it and you kiln it for a week and it's worth at least 10 times, possibly more. Um, they started a malting facility. So the, the people that did were all retired uh, computer folks and pilots. These are people that built their own airplanes. And I haven't built an airplane, but I, I think if somebody does, that shows that they're pretty careful about what they do. Did you, know? you fly it? it? Yeah, if they, if they can land it, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so, so they're, they're doing an incredible malting facility. They're putting about $3 million into it right now. It's, it's truly state-of-the-art malting that's going on. That's the first malting facility probably ever in that part of the state. Up to this point, the brewers had no choice. It's just like the bakers, right? You're using commodity stuff or something really funky. Right, so what the brewers are saying after working with these maltsters is we've been painting in black and white, now we have a colored palette. They're adding flavor through malt where there was none prior to this. There was none because it's defined by the commodity market, the way there's no flavor in our flour. It's our white flour, it's soulless, faceless, nameless, tasteless, whatever list you want to add to it, right? So, so those are those are some of the things that we're working on. I, I did mention funding before lunch, and, and we don't, uh, and there were some, some disclaimers from the scientists of where their funding comes from. We receive our funding from a town that's nearby us. We receive, they give us $150,000. It's a town of 800. We receive money from Cliff Bar Family Foundation. We receive money from the Port of Skagit, and we receive some money from the Rockefeller family, from the DR Rockefeller Fund, because they're interested in, in uh, adding value to local communities through nutritional work as well. So, so I'll stop there. <coughs> when I, I, I've been up a few times, and last time I was up, and everybody's telling me I should pay attention to malting, and so he sent me over to this malting house, and there's this guy on a forklift moving some, uh, a, a, a bin of wheat around. And um, so he was the chief information officer, C, C, chief financial officer for this big trucking company, this company that makes Peterbilt and Kenilworth and all that. And uh, he'd retired and he's really happy on that truck lift, on that uh, <laughs> forklift. And that is the most alive place. It's really extraordinary, I think. Um, so Joe has had a lot of experience in milling. And he's come from conventional milling and, um, and then really set out in this very different approach to do stone milling, which he's been doing for some time, but he has a deep understanding of milling. So I'd asked him to sort of go through and tell us what. Thank you very much, Bob. I'm amazed how you have uh, watched me grow in the last few years, and it's been a pleasure to have all your questions, even though I don't answer them all. <laughs> well, it, you, you, you're tricky. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that is great. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of conventional milling, the way it is in the, in the industry or in industrial nations, and they're making white flour, and this is what happens. They blend the wheat to the meat to the specifications of the, of the miller, and they have a basic cleaning process, removing all the foreign material in the dockage. Dockage is anything that is not wheat that's going to the mill. It may be wheat seeds, it may be any, any material you don't want. The tempering process raises the moisture level of that grain to about 15 to 16 percent moisture. That's quite a gain when you're paying for wheat and you're adding another 15 to 20 percent to it in just in the form of water. But anyway, let's leave it at 15 percent. I have seen wheat coming off the field in, the, in Washington and Oregon, pardon me, 8 percent moisture, not uncommon. Midwest, you're looking at 13 to 15 percent moisture. Quite frequently, it has to be dried for storage. Wheat to the mill will, the wheat is going to the mill now to begin the separation of the endosperm, the bran, and the germ. The separation process is very, very real. They remove the, the germ, and they remove the, the bran, and you never see it again. And it sounds poetic, doesn't it? Now we have removed 25 to 28 percent of the wheat, which in, of the material other than the endosperm, which includes all the nutritional values short of the starchy material, which is called the endosperm. Okay, 
Now, endosperm by itself is not a bad product. It, it's nutritious. It has starch value. It has food value. But there's no need to do this, and you'll find out in a minute. Now we can continue to mill the endosperm in what is referred to as a reduction milling process to arrive at conventional white flour. Here's when the party really begins. Listen to this. The engineering is unbelievably beautiful. <laughs> flour is now directed to a purifier. <laughs> now why do you want to purify it? Well, they want absolute white flour. Absolute white flour. And the engineering behind these purifiers is beautiful. You see when you can't believe what you're looking at. The reverse air lifts out any particle of brain that's left in that white endosperm flower and remove it to make the color even better. So this is a reverse air flow which is designed to lift out any residual brain pieces left in the product. After the purification, it sounds a little bit religious if I do. <laughs> it's complete, the flower milling, middling pass through the flowering rolls. And that's simply a reduction process to take the granulation to a finer granulation. You can repeat this several times, depending on the specifications of the buyer. Now here comes the payoff. The flower now enters the bleaching process, which changes the creamy color of the carotene and takes the creamy color and makes it white. And it makes it so white, it's just beautiful. Now, you're going to top it all out, the flour is now required to be enriched. Now, we're going to put it back in. This is a government regulation that you have to put it back in. But you're not going to put it all in. You're just going to put a few vitamins and mark it enriched on your loaf of bread. Enrichment requirements were put in place in 1940, replacing the B vitamins in the iron and 20 other key nutri nutrients that are lost in the milling process. Enrichment doesn't come close to replacing all the lost food value. Commercial grades of whole wheat flour are prepared by reconstituting the endosperm with reground bran. The, the germ is left out in the feed pile. Now, why do they do this? The bran is very tough to soak and by compared to the endosperm. So you mill it very fine, you can blend it back in. Now, hold on, here we go. Welcome to Certified Foods. I have to tell you, we have recently been taken over by Bay State Milling Company, and I'm representing them here today. But I'm the founder and the president, ex emeritus of Certified Foods. After several years of lock and see, look and see, and the many years in the grain and the milling industry, I've designed the milling process which preserves the nutritional values of the whole grain and the resulting flour. The whole milling process will begin by cleaning the wheat to the seed grade. What does that mean? 99 out of 100 kernels are perfect. They're mature, and there are no ifs and buts about it. It really enhances the quality of the flour. The main design principle in place leaves the grain intact. I like to call it whole milling, as it flows through the milling process without any separation of germ bran or endosperm at any time. Based on this morning's information. I'm not going to elaborate on that any further because it is a fairly lengthy process, but the nutritional value is greatly enhanced in this process. I should use the word preserves. This process maintains the natural balance of all the nutrients in the flour, including the antioxidants in the brain which inter interact with the germ, preventing the natural fats from becoming oxidized the nutritional value of the whole grain flour is enhanced and delivers optimum flavor in the finished baked foods. I want you to know that that has taken a lot of work to get where we are. But we guarantee the product and we're very happy to sign the name right on the bag. I find it very interesting that when you look at the history of flour milling, and you start in the 1850s somewhere there, and you see Simon Engineering designing flour mills that are fully automated and, or, and are fully designed to produce a white bag of flour, white flour product in a bag. <laughs> it's hard to believe that we have spent 150 years or more living with this condition in our society and not doing something about this. I find it very sad. So there's a 
pessimistic view of the milling industry and there's an optimistic point of view. We like to think we're optimistic or sufficient to give you a product that you really like to have. Those are my introductory comments. I'm very happy to be with you. I thank Bob for his hospitality and for you all to come. I couldn't think he could put that many people together, but he did. <laughs> Including you. So, <laughs> so Joe, I had one question. You, you talk about um, uh, seed quality, that, that the grain you're, you're milling is, is seed quality meaning that a very high percentage, 98 or 99 percent, is, uh, is alive and will generate a seed. Great. H how do you know that? What's, what's the process, and, and what do you think the value of that is? Well, the nutritional value is extremely high of these grains. And what is the other question? Do you know how you, you assess? Size, so you, size, you just clean it. Oh, you, it. oh you, can, you can size it with, with screens in the, in the cleaning process. Do you know anything about the seeds that go into all-purpose white, you know, industrial flour? Is that the case? What, what percentage of seed might, uh, might be not live seed in? Uh, Anywhere from 3 to 5 percent. How much? Sometimes as high as 3 to 5 percent. Uh -huh. But the farmers are getting much smarter. They're buying cleaning equipment and they're shipping less garbage to the mill. Great. Um, so, um, Doug, in tell us what your In honor of the California Wheat Commission, we process 90% of all our wheat from grown in California. Yeah. It's your turn. Thank you. Yeah. Well, such august uh, company. Uh, makes me a little uh, humble about this opportunity to be here. Um, I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging uh, Bob for uh, the pioneering work in creating uh, an ever-growing network uh, of us, those of us uh, who are passionate uh, about local whole grains. And I couldn't do this without acknowledging the work of Monica Spiller who has single-handedly made it possible for so many of us to be growing, uh, with all due respect, Stephen, the old uh, heirloom land race varieties. Um, it'll be interesting to have more of a conversation about this as we uh, proceed, so uh, it'll I'll, be good conversation. I'll, I'll forego yeah. that now. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to do is ask uh, everyone in the room here who is currently growing grain to raise your hand and hold it there. Look around. Well, that's interesting. All right. Thank you all for doing this. Uh, I'll say more well, about that's this. That's amazing, I think. I mean, you know. <laughs> uh, we might think in some ways of this as romancing the grain. <laughs> Uh, Matthew was asking me uh, why I grow some of the varieties that I grow, and I said I can't stop growing them uh, because the grains themselves call to be grown out and used and used in food. Um, some of our uh, Chittam Blanc de Mars is currently in France at the competition uh, under the care of Mike Zakowski, the baker, um, I'm happy to say. He thinks, Monica, he thinks Chittam Blanc may be his new favorite, he tells me. So the Mendocino Grain Project is in its fifth season. Uh, we are, by all definitions, small scale. Uh, we don't own our own land. I don't own uh, a nickel's worth of land, luckily. Uh, I have opportunity to lease land uh, from a vineyard that has uh, open field uh, uh, available on their property. And so we've been able to grow on the scale in the last couple of years of around 50 acres 
of grains, the majority being uh, wheat, the majority being uh, old land race varieties, those familiar to many of you, uh, Red Fife, Marquis, India Jammu, uh, Ethiopian Blue Tinge, um, and many other of these uh, wonderfully named, in my opinion, uh, wheats. And uh, our mainstays are uh, the, what I think of as the heritage wheat of California, Sonora, uh, and uh, Red Fife, which continues to be uh, a favorite. I didn't realize until I read a paper, um, a presentation, looked at a, a presentation online that uh, Sonora wheat, which I had thought was always southwestern, was grown in, in fairly substantial uh, quantities as far north as Washington, Stephen. I, uh, you knew this, but I didn't until recently. Um, one of the things that, uh, that, that uh, I hold as a principle in this work uh, is to grow locally suited grains. Um, and so we are growing grains that we hope uh, are suited to our uh, Northern California, <coughs> excuse me, inland Mendocino County, Russian River Valley uh, climate, as unpredictable as it has become. Uh, we're in our third year of drought and um, much to my pleasure, the dry farmed uh, wheats have made it. Uh, they've survived and uh, have, have produced, albeit at a much lower level. Um, we distribute our wheat primarily, our grains primarily, uh, through uh, a CSA modeled uh, grain share. And so we, on average, uh, have around 50 grain share members who either take their grain whole uh, to mill it themselves at home or take it as freshly uh, milled flour that's distributed on uh, a, free, a fairly frequent basis. Uh, we sell directly to a few bakers, uh, Mike, Rhonda, uh, and a few others. Uh, and. I would say that for us, a, a, a big issue right now is not so much um, how to market, but how to meet the demand, uh, because that, that is growing significantly. I'll address, uh, I'll address that topic uh, a bit further uh, in a moment. One of the things that, I, that is unique uh, about the Mendocino Grain Project is that we we grow it, we take, we take the grain all the way from growing to milling and distribution. Uh, there aren't too many farmers who have the capacity of doing the, the whole range uh, of, of the operation. Consequently, we find ourselves uh, harvesting grain with our little uh, plot research combine in, in four other counties besides our own. Uh, we find ourselves cleaning grain uh, for uh, a, a dozen other farmers in those uh, four or five counties. And we're happy to be part of a larger network of grain growers, uh, the likes of John Laboito. I don't think uh, others here from our, what we call our North Coast Grains Group, uh, which now numbers on our uh, Google discussion list uh, about 80 people. We have some lively discussions about everything from seed selection to uh, gluten and milling methods um, to... Uh, and harvesting was a favorite and, part. And harvesting and storing and the whole works. And it's, it's driven, I would say, largely by the farmers and the bakers uh, and those also who are passionate about uh, the grains themselves. Um, that's, that's uh, in very short order, the, uh, uh, the story of the Mendocino Grain Project. Uh, Bob invited me to talk a little bit about um, uh, this being a, a, a report and a to-do list uh, gathering to talk a bit about uh, what, what do we need? What do we need to grow this? One of the reasons I wanted to see the number of, 
uh, farmers growing grains uh, is because one of the things that we need are more farmers growing grain uh, on these small scales that either can be uh, direct marketed truly in a truly local way uh, where the identity is preserved um, or who collectively can combine resources and product to meet the needs of those uh, who require larger quantities of wheat or grain. Uh, we have a local bakery, for example, in Ukiah that could use truckloads of flour. We're not in a position to provide that ourselves, I can, I can. but you can. <laughs> <clears throat> but you, but we don't have the growing capacity for them to grow to bake with Mendocino County grown grain, which is one, honestly one of my passions, is to see returned to the local communities this capacity to grow, clean, store, process, mill, and distribute uh, these old varieties of wheat, uh, as well as some of the promising newer ones. Um, you can tell that that is a strong passion for me. We have, a, we have just one of our small, smaller scale breweries in our county uh, could use a truckload of malted barley a day, five days a week, year round. If we could grow it and if we had the capacity to malt it locally. So thankfully we have a fellow in our larger uh, network who wants to build just such a facility uh, because that's one of the value-added products, as Stephen pointed out so well, that can tenfold multiply for uh, us the value of what we grow. Uh, value-added products is, is, uh, is a key way for uh, us to begin to further distribute and uh, increase the use of uh, the local grains. So I said we need more farmers. The other thing we need is infrastructure. And I, that's a capital I infrastructure. Um, we're using in our grain cleaning and separating process a 100-year-old piece of equipment, uh, a double spiral separator. And if you want to know what that is, you have to come visit, and I'll demonstrate it for you. Um, it, it was in the original flour mill uh, in um, Covalo, California, Round Valley, uh, Mendocino County. And we're lucky enough to have it on loan from a farmer who ended up having that in his possession, uh, Steve Decatur of Live Power Community Farm, known to probably some of you in this room. That We had to go to Minnesota to get our uh, grain cleaner and our gravity table so we could produce those uniformly whole, uh, beautiful berries for milling and for seed. Um, and uh, so, so it's this kind of infrastructure that used to exist in most of our communities and does not any longer because of the so-called efficiency uh, that we have arrived at through huge scale, industrial scale, growing of anonymous wheat. So just, just for reference, how much grain can you clean in a day with that? Uh, just with our capacity alone, I'd say the record was probably set last September with John and another farmer when we cleaned about 10,000 pounds uh, in a matter of a few hours. But we can, we, can, we can run through both our seed cleaner and our gravity table something on the order of 125 bushels an hour, which if you do the math real quickly at let's assume it averages 60 pounds, uh, what is that, uh, 6,000, uh, it's about 7,500 pounds uh, an hour. So if we, if we had the growers and we ran that operation full time, uh, we could clean a pile, as my farmer friend John says, gobs of grain uh, and, and do a good job of it. We need the infrastructure to continue to uh, be able to do that regionally because it doesn't exist. Uh, the larger scale operators want a truckload. We don't grow by the truckload. We grow by the wagon load and the grape bin full and the barrel full. And so we're happy to be able to offer that 
uh, process and that service. But right now, we need a full-blown granary. It's time to build it. And uh, I'm convinced that when we build it, as happened with that baseball field in Iowa, they will come. <laughs> so, so that's the story. If you're interested in talking granary, I get to say what I need. We need investors to build a granary. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. So just for perspective, <laughs> what we're trying to do is look at someone like Doug and the farmers that he has. And so we're trying to understand the varieties that we want to grow <clears throat> and what will be useful to Matthew and to Sherry and to a variety of, and to you, Josie and all these fine bakers and, um, and, and ramp up. So we're at multiple truckloads so that we can fill grocery stores with um, really good quality locally grown organic identity preserved wheat so that people know what it is. And, and the identity preserved aspect is critical because it's, it, it, it's the label. You know, like we're, we're looking for a certification or, you know, it's, it's, it's the label and it's not, um, it, it carries with it specific information. Who did it? When did they do it? Where, were the, where was that done? We're looking for other things in that identity. We th I don't think we're finished with that label. I think it's going to need more stuff in it, and we're looking for that more stuff. But this is all part of, a, you know, like I think Doug is really important to what we're doing um, as our larger farmers. There's some larger farmers here also. Um, Matthew, why don't you start? We were going to do this in the afternoon with the bakers, but I think you should start and tell us what you're doing. So I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about marketing, and I'm not in marketing. I have never marketed anything. <laughs> um, let me, let me, so Matthew is our friend at Whole Foods. He's head of a uh, bakery for Northern California Whole Foods Bakery. He's been in other uh, areas also, and he's, um, you know, from the beginning with Community Greens, he's been really helpful in trying to move this along. And, um, and, and, a lot of what happens here really hinges on our ability, you know, to create infrastructure, sort of like, oh, well, we want these big bins. Okay, well, what are you going to do with them? What are you going to put in them? How much is that going to cost? Who's going to buy them? What are you going to do with it? You kind of can't plan an infrastructure if you don't have a market. And so we're trying to inch this up together. And uh, it's not just him. It's um, we're looking at you guys, too. And... Um, trying to get uh, talented people who, who you can say, oh, well, you know, you wanted this, and you can't really do that with this, but you can do this if you, and Steve will talk about what the Bread Lab does, is, is, is give bakers information they need in order to get what they want with what we have. That's the, so, sorry for interrupting. No, no you're fine. So uh, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to start off telling you a story that, again, has, has nothing to do with marketing. But um, for me, looking uh, around the room in 100 or so faces uh, really rings true, especially um, in terms of timing. So about two weeks ago, I was in Austin, Texas, which is um, where Whole Foods Market was founded. Um, every four years, we have an event called Tribal Gathering. And uh, there's about 1,200 people that come together. <laughs> Store team leaders, coordinators, regional vice presidents, regional presidents, the board of directors, the CEOs, everybody. And we bring the tribes together. And this event is um, geared towards creating a vision or reuniting us as a tribe and looking forward, celebrating a little bit of the past, but then looking forward and kind of figuring out if that's where we're going to go and how do we get there as a, as a tribe, as a group. Uh, the really fascinating thing about Tribal Gathering, there's, n there's no directive that comes of it. There's no homework. There's nothing. And so how you internalize it, what you do with it, how you take it home as a coordinator, as a store team leader, how you embody it is up to you. If it never shows up, no one will ever know. And so for me, um, so this was a couple weeks ago. And we had just, it was opening day. We had just got finished listening to Walter Robb give one of his uh, opening, or co-CEOs, one of his... Uh, opening keynote speeches. And he invited up a gentleman by the name of uh, Dan Barber from uh, Blue Hill Farm. 
And Dan got up and, and um, started giving this speech about the future of food. Kind of a talk around how food had been bred specifically to get it to market so it held up, so it could go into stol uh, you know, to, to cold storage, so it could be peeled easier. And he was very specifically talking about a butternut squash. And uh, he said he felt like the future of food was about breeding, but about breeding food from a flavor standpoint, simply for sheer pleasure and sheer, sheer flavor. And everyone kind of thought the talk was done and um, popped up on the screen behind him just a simple image of a wheat kernel. And he, he said, that's, that's the future of food. That's, that's what's next. And a lot of people, you know, it, a lot of people have no here. Actually, even said a lot of people have no idea what that actually probably is. <laughs> and for those of you who do, you probably recognize it as something that gets ground up and made into flour. And uh, his his kind of point was: is the future of food in the next couple of years is taking that and turning it into something more than just flour. Later on that afternoon, uh, I had the pleasure of listening to Stephen Jones, who. Uh, that was the first time I had the opportunity to, to, to listen to him speak. But I remember walking out of both those meetings and calling Bob with sheer, which I'm sure a lot of people in this room have done, with sheer giddiness. Because so many things that we have done over the last couple of years um, were on such a larger scale. I mean, 1,200 people that lead my company had just heard this talk around the future of food being wheat and the evolution of wheat. And, and for the record, Dan's conversation uh, got deep into whole grains. And he went back to the kitchen. And he asked his baker, classically French trained baker, to make a brioche loaf out of whole grain. And his baker walked out. <laughs> um, after multiple attempts, he did it. And the baker and Dan looked at each other and said, this is really good. Not only does it do everything that a brioche loaf should do, but it actually tastes like something. So um, that's where I'm coming from personally. That's where um, kind of this, for me, this, this conversation is starting. Um, I, I think I, I say it the obvious that the marketing uh, in this process can be incredibly complicated. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, I try to make a list of all the things that we could actually market that we could actually talk about to the consumer. And one thing I do know about Whole Foods Market, I've worked for Whole Foods Market for 10 years, is um, we know how to tell a lot of stories, and sometimes we overly complicate it to the umpteenth degree. Right, you walk into any one of our stores, and the number of messages that you're hit with, I have no idea why you guys buy anything from us, honestly, because <laughs> it, it really, we, the number of stories we attempt to tell you even within that, that 20 feet that you're in inside our, our market, I'm overwhelmed. So uh, we could talk about the local aspect, right? We could market, but let's say we, we create a brand, we create a vision, we can market the local aspect of it. We can talk about the farmer, so now it's local, and we could talk about the farmer, right? We could go into great detail about the farmer. We could talk about the whole grain aspect. Well, once we talk about whole grain, we could probably then talk about the variety of grain, right? So now you're talking about variety grain, whole grain, stone milled. You can talk about why stone milled is better. And from stone milled, you're starting to get the health benefits of it. Why is it healthier for you? What's whole grain, right? So you then, let's say you attempt to answer the question that a lot of people had earlier on after listening to Stephen and, and uh, Michael talk. What is actually whole grain? And then you could probably wrap it up by trying to market and talk a little bit about taste. So, uh, you know, I, I, hmm, I don't have an answer. Uh, it's a little bit of a question to this group on where do you start in that process. Uh, I want to, um, I'll tell you kind of how what we've done up until this point, but I want to caution this group to not overly complicate the message. Um, start somewhere, but it doesn't have to be everywhere. Um, and, and can it get eventually better? I, I think it can. And so the cookies you tasted uh, at lunch are 100% um, whole grain. Uh, I, was telling, I was talking to Michael uh, after lunch, and I, I, that doesn't make them good for you, right? 
I like to think that, right? And if I tried to market them that way, I'd be, I'd be run out of the store. But we felt really strongly that we needed to start somewhere, right? We could talk all day long about making a great bread or working with partners to make great bread. Uh, but really what we wanted to do is we wanted to get the product in people's mouths and in a pretty big way. So we launched that cookie program about three and a half weeks ago and we have sold about 55,000 cookies. I know. <laughs> That's a lot of cookies, yeah. How many? 55,000. You sold 55,000 cookies in how long? In about three weeks. A day. Jeez. <laughs> so my friend Doug may not be able to help me with, with wheat, and that's okay, because maybe that program, maybe that particular program doesn't use local grain that I'm able to identify or maintain its identity. But I, I think that I've started a dialogue with my consumers. I know for a fact I've started a dialogue with my team, both in the store and on my regional team. And it's an it's a interesting dialogue. So the way we've approached that particular program is um, we've, we've called out a couple things. Uh, very simply stated that the wheat is 100% California grown, 100% uh, stone milled within California. There are probably a lot of people making similar claims. Um, but again, I felt like within our, within our four walls, that was, pretty, that was pretty radical for us to say that. So we, we started there. Um, we did mention the fact that it was whole grain. And then how we got into that kind of next phase is the reason we, we actually came out and said the reason we think or the reason we are using whole grain is because we think it tastes better. And that was it. Those four simple statements. Um, before launching the cookies this past, over the past six or eight months, we introduced the cookies quietly at Eat Real this past year. We did an ice cream sandwich in which we did not market whole grain at all. We let people buy close to 2,000 ice cream sandwiches, and then afterwards we asked them what they thought of the cookie and if they enjoyed their whole grain cookie. And again, there's, there's, a, there's a look of disbelief when you tell someone it's a whole grain cookie. Again, because it's, we're using an application where it actually it tastes better, the nuttiness the nuttiness of the grains shows up really, real, really, really well in the cookie itself. Um, very similar, uh, it's a similar kind of conversation. The chocolate chip cookie, we call it hipster chipster that you tasted this afternoon. The hipster part of it is it's a vegan cookie. We don't call it vegan because the second you, the second you define it, the second, you, right, the second you define it as vegan, you, it gets a groupy following and then everyone else hates vegan food, and so they run away from it. But the really fascinating thing is when it's just a chocolate chip cookie with a cool name, people love it. So chew on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, with all that said, I do think we have a huge opportunity from a quantity. If we could get the quantities, quantities right, I do think we have an opportunity to tell some amazing story, stories from a farmer and a varietal standpoint. I, I think that exists. I think that exists not just within Whole Foods, but outside of Whole Foods. But to Doug's point, the infrastructure has to be there. Um, I don't know what it looks like. I, I've got some, uh, some fellow uh, Whole Foodies in the room, but I think that, you know, I, I'd be careful putting it out there, but I think you might have a partner in, so, in, in some sort of way in this process, right? I don't know what that looks like. It's a journey. But um, there is definitely a dialogue happening within our company that this might be a big thing. Um, and more importantly than a big thing, it might be the right thing. And, um, and that's, you know, we, we, we do a lot of things and we try to be on the side of right as much as we possibly can. So um, we might have a partner in that process. So, um, you know, I, I do want to make uh, kind of one final um, two, maybe two final statements. The first thing is um, I was listening to uh, Chad uh, on NPR uh, from Tartine uh, over the holidays, driving around from store to store to store, checking on program execution. And he was on NPR talking about um, cookies and whole grain cookies based on his new book. And there was a question around the health benefits of it. And I, I forget the exact way he worded it, but it was very simple and, and very, you know, to the point that I made earlier. I don't care if it's better for you. It just tastes good. 
right? And so I think that's really, uh, for me personally and, and for us, I really, uh, for me, I think that's where, where we kind of need to focus our energy and our attention. At least from a Whole Foods market standpoint, that's where we're kind of directing our attention over the next couple of months before it kind of unravels a little bit more. Um, I would also challenge this group. Um, so it's clear um, that the, <laughs> be careful, that uh, the Whole Grain Council, um, uh, federal government, um, and the body that regulates uh, what is whole grain, what is whole wheat, um, at this point is made up their mind. Uh, I don't think that should stop this group from making a decision on what it should be and what, how, we should, um, how we should define what we're talking about. And, and what I mean is, is um, I know from a Whole Foods Market standpoint over Years and years of uh, years and years of experience, we've lobbied and gone to um, different bodies to help define uh, animal welfare standards and some other things, and we've got a ton of pushback on it. And instead of waiting for those laws and those rules to change, we created some standards. And some people don't like them, uh, and I don't think they're perfect. I don't think we claim they're perfect. But one thing that we do know is, you know, so uh, we we created a system that labels um, our meat products, uh, global, GAP, Global Animal Partnership, that gives all our meat within our uh, stores a rating system. So you as a consumer can make a decision on how that animal is treated and if that's what you want to buy. And so um, my point is, is I don't think we should wait for the Whole Grain Council to change their mind, because it might be a while. Um, I do think there's probably a, a, quite a few smart incredibly intelligent people in this room, if we got our heads together, I think we could come up with something. But again, what that looks like and narrowing it down to make sure uh, we're not overly complicating the story, I think is a pretty important, um, pretty important deal. So that's what I got.